uh, yeah, my name's Alvis Dunn, and I'm in the history department here at UN, uh, UNC Asheville. Uh, and I do have to stand a little bit still. You guys, my students in here know that I wander quite a bit. Um, this is tentatively titled Black Mountain Poet Robert Creeley, Bobby Louise Hawkins, and Family and Life on a Coffee Finca in Guatemala, 1959 through 1961. Uh, I, I, frankly, I originally had begun this project uh, in what I thought in pursuit of Robert Creeley, uh, only to find out that it was a lot more than just Robert Creeley. It was um, Robert Creeley's partner, uh, Bobby Louise Hawkins, and their four nine years and under daughters. They all went to Guatemala and lived there for this, uh, be between 59 and um, 1961. Now, um, Creeley, uh, wrote one poem titled Guatemala and uh, I'm still trying to figure out how many other poems that he wrote that have allusions to Guatemala, have a feeling of Guatemala about them. But, uh, and this one, I'm no poetry critic and my uh, understanding of this poem sort of waxes and wanes and sometimes I completely don't understand it but I'm going to read it. it's a very short poem and I'll um, uh, he actually didn't write this poem until 20 years after the time in Guatemala as well so he was clearly reflecting back uh, it's titled Guatemala when I heard the story in the company of the priest strung up by his thumbs while his humble young woman servant was raped and his monies taken, I was impressed and told my wife all of it. Later, my sources explained to her the verbs and the noun in Spanish meant the priest had lost his gold. No one was with him more than his wanting. I hope someday I'll understand that uh, poem more. Uh, I'm far from finished studying Robert Creeley and uh, Bobby Louise Hawkins. Creeley is um, one of the most influential English language poets of the second half of the 20th century. I think uh, most would at least agree on that. One of his most notable early associations is with was with Black Mountain uh, poets of Black Mountain College in these Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina where he both studied and taught. He's also connected with many of the artists known as the Beats. Uh, the crowd in which he traveled included Allen Ginsberg, Jack Kerouac, Amiri Baraka, Charles Olson, Denise Levertov, Ed Dorn, William Burroughs, Lawrence Ferlin Getty, happy birthday, he just turned 100, William Carlos Williams, and Robert Duncan. Uh, Creeley was born in 1926 in Massachusetts and attended Harvard until with the beginning of World War II, he joined the American Field Service, drove an ambulance in uh, India and Southeast Asia. After the war, he came back to Harvard, but he never graduated from there. During some of the period that he was affiliated with Black Mountain College, he lived part-time with his first wife in Mallorca. He was briefly a chicken farmer in New Hampshire, and later he earned uh, <clears throat> his MA at the University of New Mexico after uh, graduating, maybe one of the only people to actually graduate from Black Mountain College. Uh, he taught at a boys' school in New Mexico, uh, but also spent a good time in San Francisco, which is where he met, met, met so many of the Beats. He also met Bobby Louise Hawkins uh, during his time in the West. Uh, this f uh, photograph that I uh, am, have here is Creeley, Hawkins in the middle, a friend of theirs, and uh, a, a pretty famous Volkswagen van, and they're in New Mexico. Uh, he met Hawkins, uh, who was working as an all-night disc jockey, 
1957 in Albuquerque uh, when one of Creeley's friends uh, brought him by the radio station. The two became a couple almost immediately. Hawkins was a Texan and like Creeley when they met a recent divorcee. Hawkins had two daughters from her marriage to a Danish architect. She had lived in Denmark, she had lived in Japan, she lived in London previously. Uh, so she was a bit of a wanderer herself. Creeley had two sons and a daughter uh, from his first marriage, but they were not with him in New Mexico. Uh, the two, uh, Creeley and Hawkins, were very quick to start a family. Uh, by the summer of 1959, they had a two-year-old and a toddler. That year with Hawkins and their four assorted children, four girls, they traveled by Volkswagen bus to Guatemala where Creeley tutored the children of coffee plantation owners for two years. But we'll get to the Guatemala part of the story soon. Uh, a good deal of the minutia of Creeley's life and times can be gleaned from uh, Egbert Foss's Robert Creeley, a biography. It's quite a Quite a tome. Uh, the author, to my read, demonstrated no small amount of attitude concerning his subject. Uh, I have to admit that in my own still quite short study of Creeley, what I've found out has also fostered some strongish sentiments about him as well. That said, I, I very much understand that I hardly know the man. Uh, two years ago, a student of mine, a student in the history department who was interning at the Western Regional Archives uh, here in Asheville, mentioned Creeley and his Guatemala connection to me. Uh, around that time, I also attended the Black Mountain Studies Conference as a panel moderator, and there on that panel was, a, was the literary criticist and, uh, from Rochester Institute of Technology, John Roach, and he presented a paper uh, on that panel about Creeley at the Placitas Colony in uh, New Mexico, which was uh, a sort of a conglomeration of beat and Black Mountain Bohemian poets hanging out there in the mid-60s New Mexico. Uh, that was very soon after I had heard about Creeley in Guatemala, and Roach and I had a brief discussion about that time at that time about the connection. Uh, the, Creeley was one of the greatest American poets and writers of the 20th century is not something that, that, that I'm really going to delve into here. Uh, he was at Black Mountain from 1954 to 1956, but as I mentioned, he was in and out because he was in Mallorca some of the time. He was also editing Black Mountain Review, and like I also mentioned, somehow he earned a degree and then began teaching there. Um, the Creeley Hawkins Guatemala sojourn ran from September 1959 uh, until late April of 1961. The family returned to the United States for the summer in 1960 because Creeley had won a D.H. Lawrence scholarship and that came with a stipend and a rent-free stay on a ranch near Taos. That award saw the Creeleys heading north in April of 1960 and then returning to Guatemala in early September so that he could start back his tutoring on the Fincas. All told, the, span, the family spent about 16 months living on the south coast of Guatemala. Uh, Creeley goes on later in his life to teach at the University of Buffalo. He teaches at Brown University. He and Bobby Louise Hawkins parted ways in 1975. She went on to a very productive career as an author, painter, performer, and teacher. Uh, teaching for over 20 years at Naropa University. Uh, she passed away this past May, and Creeley died in 2005. Uh, Creeley and Hawkins made their way to Guatemala with four children in a VW bus, a feat in 1959 that represented a very high difficulty level. They also did a down and back in the summer of 60 and returned to the U.S. the same way when they forsook Guatemala for good in 61. Kristen and Leslie 
were Bobby Hawkins' children from their first marriage and roughly nine and eight years old, while Creeley and Hawkins had two babies of their own as well, Sarah two and Kate not yet one. It's frankly an insane idea. Uh, in the late 1980s, I made two drives to Guatemala from North Carolina. The first in a 1984 Ford Escort resulted in a great many hours spent in the yards of shaded tree mechanics across Mexico as they pondered and piddled their way to correcting the myriad problems that rough highways, bad gas, and hidden speed bumps brought. Second trip was in a diesel fueled pickup. Uh, it was less eventful both because of the vehicle, because of the vehicle and the experience that I had gained, uh, and probably also because that truck never came back to the United States. It was the return trip when many things went wrong anyway. In 57, Creeley, Hawkins, and the then family of just three little girls made an initial road trip to, into southern Mexico. They, visit, they went as far south as San Cristobal de las Casas. Uh, in Chiapas, they spent a month living in the coastal city of Veracruz. Uh, in a 1978 interview, Creeley described meeting the famous anthropologist Franz Blom uh, in San Cristobal and being introduced by him to a Lacandon Maya man who, according to Creeley, this is very Creeley-esque as best I could tell, Creeley, this man was so completely where he was, not that he knew where he was, or was determined to stay there, but was absolutely alive in the moment each instant. So Creeley and Hawkins were not exactly tenderfeet in regard to traveling Mexican highways when they set out from Albuquerque in their Volkswagen van for Guatemala in 1959. Uh, that said, journeying that by road to the southwest coast of Guatemala in 59 really took a mighty dose of courage or ignorance or perhaps a measure of both. The route taken today would pretty much parallel the same one that you would take 60 years ago. And I, I took some of that route myself. Uh, Foss, the author of this tome, who re relied very heavily on correspondence for writing about Creeley's Guatemala time. Uh, he mentions no place names and he really doesn't give any detail about the Mexico crossing. He does note that they, they went into Guatemala from Mexico at, at, at a location much closer than normal to the Pacific Ocean because a landslide had blocked the more taken route. The change of plans involved loading their van on a train car at the city of Arriaga. The city of Arriaga is somewhat well known today because it is the beginning of what is often referred to as the death train or the train that many children take as they make their way seeking asylum in the United States these days. While uh, Foss's Robert Creeley a biography is generally quite richly detailed, the time in Guatemala really suffers from a lack of daily life material. Um, there might be some more information in the Creeley archives at Stanford, but my preliminary online perusal does not very promising. Creeley did write a lot of letters. He wrote at least 36 letters to friends between August 59 and March 61, and they're published in the selected letters of Robert Creeley. Uh, I, it's quite amazing to me how well documented the Black Mountain College people are, one and all. Uh, those correspondences provide at least some windows into the life on the coffee finca. We'll get to the finca in a minute. Uh, this is the entrance to the finca where, uh, this is a photograph of the entrance to the finca Los Tarales, where the Creeleys, where Robert Creeley taught school. In fact, in this photograph to the far, on the right side of the photograph, you can see a white building with one window in it. That is the schoolhouse uh, where Creeley held class. Uh, several themes permeate Creeley's letters at that time. One a great sense of isolation. This is not particularly surprising. This is a very isolated place today. It's two, the happiness that their large family felt there together. Three, uh, that Guatemala, especially life on a plantation, was a place of modern feudalism. And uh, 
Fourth, uh, he's very distressed by the high price of goods, the high price of uh, things that he wanted, which beer and crackers were very important in his life. <laughs> I can empathize with that. Uh, his letters are also very heavy uh, with um, work-related material. He writes about publishing, editorial opportunities, he's networking, he's writing Kerouac, he's writing Ginsburg, he's writing Amiri Baraka uh, during his time there, Ed Dorn, Robert Duncan, uh, multiple publishers, editors, he's working on poetry. It's interesting, that he's, he's writing a lot of poetry, he's just not writing poetry that is you know, specifically about Guatemala, you know. Um, it's, it, it has to be part of the backdrop, but uh, I, I have to spend more time with it. Uh, so the Faust biography is the most official account of this period in Creeley's life. There's another very, very illuminating telling of that tale, and it's, it's told by Bobby Louise Hawkins in a novel called The Sanguine Breast of Margaret. And... Uh, she wrote this book in the 1980s, and uh, after you know, about five or six years after she and Creeley had parted ways, uh, and it, it wasn't published until 1992, and then only in Great Britain. Uh, the book has not been widely read, and, but I have to say it's a it's a very good read. It's very well written. It's got a great storyline, and Hawkins's fiction is a th is a very thinly veiled or thinly disguised account of their time in Guatemala in the sanguine breast of Margaret Patrick, a budding writer, and Margaret Darty, along with their four young daughters, leave New Mexico bound for a job tutoring the children of side-by-side -side coffee fincaros on the south coast of Guatemala. That's not even disguised, really. The plantation families match up almost perfectly as well as the burges of the real-life Tarales, these are the, the Finca owners of Los Tarales, uh, become the Shaws of San Felipe, and the Brisanes of San Jerónimo become the Grisantes of Los Cedros uh, de San Juan. Uh, Los Tarales today is still an operating coffee farm, but also recently agriculturally diversified uh, by the cultivation of ornamental plants. Um, and the Burgess have also placed the ecology of this is an incredibly verdant uh, part of Guatemala on display by setting up a birding reserve. Uh, the guest book there shows a pretty regular stream of groups visiting, though Andy Burge, now the uh, owner of the finca, said, told, told me that times were rough economically and that he was often left scrambling to make ends meet on the finca. San Jeronimo, conversely, uh, had become the home site of one of the country's largest cheese and milk productions, though some coffee was still being harvested there. The Brissani family is one of the country's elite, owning an office building in Zone 10 of the capital, which is sort of the little Miami part of Guatemala City and producing a product brand named Parma. They're an Italian family and they come, that is recognized as one of Guatemala's finest. The histories of both of these families, one, the Burgess originally from Kentucky, the other from Northern Italy, struck me as very fascinating, quite frankly. I can't really go into that here. I, I kind of felt like they both would love for me to write their stories. Uh, the tutoring that Creeley had been hired to do began in September of 1959, took place at Los Tarales, where the Burges, the Burge family's three children, Martha 10, Catherine 8, and Andy 7, Andy owns the finca today, operates it today, lived. And from San Jeronimo, Mark Brissani uh, joined, as did the Creeley daughters, Kristen 9 and Leslie 8. Uh, the, the little boy, you could, the little boy and the girl standing behind him in the photo, the little toe-headed boy, is Mark Brissani. I'll show you a picture later of Mark Brissani today. Uh, you'll see the resemblance, quite frankly. Uh, the two plantations are very closely situated. They're walkable distance, although Mark Brissani talked about riding his mini bike between them. Uh, Los Torales, uh, like I said, is owned and operated by Burge today. He was Creeley's student. I'll show you a picture of 
There's Andy Burge right there with his little bicycle and, his sis and one of his sisters. Uh, I spent a lot of time with both of these men as they thought back on the two years that the Creeleys lived with them. Both were extremely generous with their time, though they were both really quite busy. I met Brissani in Guatemala City. Um, our initial contact came through WhatsApp. Uh, the friends connected us with WhatsApp Messenger. Uh, we set up a meeting for, this kind of threw me off, for 7 a.m. for breakfast. And then I realized, oh, he's a, he's a dairy man. This is not even early in the morning for him. Uh, and I met him at his office in Zone 10, Guatemala City. Uh, and I spent, uh, uh, I spent several days at Los Torales, where I often dined with Andy Burge uh, and spent a lot of time wandering the, the finca. Uh, while on the south coast, I was also given a pretty insightful tour of the grounds of, of uh, an operation by Brissani's son, Vito, who's attending the University of Illinois now and was home for the holidays, for the summer. Mark spends most of his time in Guatemala City, but, uh, but by small aircraft, buzzes down to the Finca regularly. Uh, uh, just, he, he fly, he'll fly down for just an hour. He'll fly down just to have lunch on the Finca. It's about an hour flight. Uh, carrying on the, the Brissani family's uh, tradition of managing the operation is his daughter, Gina Brissani, who Small world is a graduate of NC State University. Uh, and they've, they've also spent a holiday here in the mount, here in the outside of Asheville in a cabin, the Brissanis. Uh, but this lost period in Creeley and Hawkins' life, as I mentioned earlier, Hawkins wrote a fictional account, sort of fictional account. Her reminiscences of her life with Creeley strike me as measured in that her reflections on them read as containing, yeah, there's no bitterness, but simple recognition of what passed between them. Important to thinking about the sanguine breast of Margaret and that time in Guatemala are Hawkins' own words about their marriage. While artistic expression through painting was apparently encouraged, Creeley had forbidden her to write. And this is, this is a, her in an interview in uh, not that long before she died. When Bob and I were first together, he had three things he would say. One of them was, I'll never live in a house with a woman who writes. One of them was, everybody's wife wants to be a writer. And one of them was, if you had been going to be a writer, you would have been one by now. That pretty much put the cap on it. I was too married, too old, and too late, but he was wrong. I think a part of what attracted Bob to me was competencies I had within myself, but it was as if once I was within his purview, those competencies were only to be used for his needs in the space where we lived and not as though they were my own. What I was really fighting for wasn't the right to be some kind of brilliant writer. I was fighting for the right to write badly until it got better. Uh, thankfully, Hawkins didn't let that stop her. Uh, she wrote in secret during their time there on the Finca. Uh, uh, and then afterward became a very accomplished writer. One of Hawkins' own observations about her writing was that she wrote about what happened in her life. In her fictional story, she wrote about what happened in her life and what she had overheard. She was actually very well known at Naropa for requiring that her, class, her classes write about conversations they had eavesdropped. Uh, during my uh, interviews with Andy Burge and Mark Brissani during the, uh, June of 2018, they both recounted details of, of a world which, in which they were young boys that matched very well with the one described by Hawkins in The Sanguine Breast of Margaret. Hawkins described the physical layout of, of her family's living situation. The schoolhouse was at Los Torales. This is the schoolhouse today. The Burge Finca and Creeley Hawkins and their children lived at San Jeronimo Miramar, the Brissani farm. That schoolhouse actually still stands has, and has been converted into a guest house. I discovered after I was there a day that I was actually living in the schoolhouse. That was my lodge. This was the house that I stayed in during the time I was there. The house where they lived also still stands and while it's still the property of the Brissani family, it's the home of the local school teacher. 
Vito Brassani introduced me to her and she invited me into the house to see uh, where they had lived. And this is the house that they lived in at the Brassani. It was, they, they talked about it was a better house than they had had in New Mexico and it was the best house outside of the Finca owner's house. And it still pretty much is, I would say. Um, the, uh, ha this house uh, was situated, the, the, the house that uh, the Creelys lived in, it was very much in the center of everything at San Geronimo. The chapel was on one side of it, and uh, I think I have the, the, the company store. Here's a picture from those days of the company store. You can see a, a dim outline of a volcano behind it, uh, Volcanatitlan. Uh, so they, they were really in the heart of things, and in fact, that's a pretty big uh, theme in the book, The Sanguine Breast of Margaret, um, the, the fact that th everything is happening all around them and how she, in particular, is dealing with living there and the people on the Finca, the Finca workers. Uh, it's important to note that the area, uh, right, what I was saying, it was a very active area. Uh, it looked across a valley looking the other way, uh, and as is the case with just about everywhere in Guatemala, there's several volcanoes in the distance. Uh, Hawkins apparently spent her days at San Jeronimo. Creeley was at Los Torales. Uh, he went there with the Kristen and Leslie every morning. Hawkins cared for uh, the two infants, uh, Sarah and Kate, uh, back at San Jeronimo. Uh, interestingly, there's a storyline in uh, The Sanguine Breast of Margaret relates that early on Hawkins tried to teach the Brissani's Down's Syndrome child. Uh, they, they had a, a, a Down Syndrome uh, boy named Kent, and uh, he's mentioned in conversation by his brother Mark very lovingly. Uh, I have to add here that the Brissani's and the Burgess seem to have no idea that Bobby Louise Hawkins wrote this book. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm the one to spring it on them. Uh, Creeley does mention Kent Brissani very briefly in a letter to Ed Dorn. It's not particularly flatteringly. Uh, Creeley also mentions in his letters a very raucous alcohol-filled atmosphere on the Burge Finca and a rather austere and Spartan environment on San Jeronimo. Burge was a hard-drinking Kentuckian, bourbon, and uh, according to Creeley, at Hawkins' account agrees, so too do the interviews with both Burge's son, Andy, as well as the remembrances of the Brissani son. They both, as you remember, pretty rough times, pretty rough, hard-drinking weekends. Parties around the pool. This is Joe Burge, uh, it's a photo of Joe Burge. Parties around the infamous pool at Los Torales uh, are uh, part of, uh, they're marathon affairs. They're part of what is mentioned in the Sanguine Breast of Margaret, but also in the memories of these, little, these uh, now grown men, but as little boys. Um, often Valentin Bressani joins in to the drinking, the Northern Italian father. Um, what's my time? I've lost my... Okay, yeah, I'm good. Um, interestingly, Creeley mentions growing marijuana on the Finca and uh, his own consumption while living at San Jeronimo. Mark Brissani recounted to me that Creeley convinced his parents to try marijuana, uh, but they didn't appreciate it. Hawkins tells the same story in her novel. Uh, and Creeley mentions it in his letters. Uh, the point to be made is that much of what Hawkins writes is, is just perfectly corroborated by both Creeley's letters as well as my interviews with Andy Burge and Mark Brissani. There's more to this story. Uh, I, I, you know, you could do a whole paper about the book that Bobby Louise Hawkins has written. In fact, it's uh, I, if I could get a you know, if I could assign it, I would assign it as 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 a real a look at. Uh, a Guatemala that was recently post coup d'etat. The United States had overthrown the government in Guatemala in 1954, after all, and this was a very this was a Cold War uh, immersed place. Uh, it's a place just recovering from this CIA orchestrated coup in 54. 
Hawkins' book is very revealing, frankly, uh, and to a historian's eye, just deeply rooted in the truth of the times. Creeley died in 2005, and his own published memories of Guatemala are not as revealing as Hawkins' novel. In fact, he only made mention of that time in interviews, as best I've been able to find, although he, he wrote thousands and thousands and thousands of pages. Though for a while he did promise that he would write about his experiences in, in Guatemala. The only poem published by him is the one that I, uh, that specifically references the country, is the one that I opened this uh, session with. As for remarks, uh, maybe the most pointed that I've been able to find are this 1976 interview. Uh, I, in my weird American innocence, had brought this tender group, this is Creeley speaking, into this incredible place and we were there. And there's no, it was 3,000 miles straight north to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we'd otherwise be living in this old VW Combi, one of the prototypes. And the only thing we had as hope in the world was to keep that damn thing running, you know, no matter what, and so as to be able to get out. And my salary, I guess, was $3,000 for the year with a, a kind of one of those old incidental person's houses thrown in as a living place, which was good. I mean, it was certainly better far uh, than most persons in that situation had. But the, God, the incredible distance between the Patron and the workers was just unbelievable. I think their base pay was, was like $12 every two weeks. Uh, and a common shirt, you know, a shirt like this, he points to his shirt, would cost in the Guatemalan market about $10 or $12. You'd have to wait two weeks to get a shirt. We were there during John F. Kennedy's use of Guatemala, you know, as a staging number for the invasion of Cuba. It was a staging place for the Bay of Pigs. Uh, I always wondered what all those American soldiers were doing in Guatemala City all the time, especially large numbers of Air Force used to be whooping it up and down the main street, and there was no particular explanation as to why. Why there were so many American soldiers present? Well, they were there to train for the Bay of Pigs, you know. But again, this government had so little, had authority, but it was all ownership of authority. I mean, for, the, for example, the milk we drank commonly in Guatemala was shipped in from California. Foremost, you know, they had a deal with the federal government to create this weird subsidy for the hauling in of powdered milk when the country again had adequate possibilities for having its own dairy situation, endless, I don't know, very sad. There's room for more investigation into Creeley and Hawkins' time in Guatemala. And there's much, there's also much that could be learned through the history of these two fincas and the lives of the Burge and Brassani families, members. There's also much of this story that I've kept back here that remains to be told. Additionally, there exists a remarkable range of connections between the artists, teachers, and students of Black Mountain College in Latin America. From Charles Olson's fascination with Mayan hieroglyphs and Latin American geography, uh, he, he, he was a great follower of Carl Sauer, for example, uh, which seems to have ultimately shared with many colleagues to, to, the, to the work of the weaver Annie and the architect Joseph Albers, their interest in the art and architecture of Mexico and the Andes is just a wide range of research that could deepen what's already been done, but not done by a Latin American. It's not somebody coming at it from, well, from the south to Black Mountain, but everybody's coming out of Black Mountain trying to see Latin America. And I, 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 th I think I, you know, as much as I have time and energy for, I, I want to see what I can do as a Latin Americanist to bring uh, Latin America to um, Black Mountain. Now I'm going to show you guys a, a, a few more photos. Now the, the, the Burgess gave me these. Most, the photos that are in black and white, uh, the Burgess gave me. I took the color ones. So if we go back to the very beginning, uh, actually I took that one. Uh, this one was actually, I found this one online. This was a part of a, a, a university, Pennsylvania University piece. Uh, uh, the Burgess gave me this one. Uh, that's Google Maps. Uh, the Burgess gave me this. This is the entrance to Los Terrales. Uh, the Burgess gave me this. This is, this is ne really basically never seen photograph of Creeley and uh, the children. And there's Mark Brassani there, uh, the, the little blonde boy in the, in, to the 
right side. Uh, Andy Burge and his sister Martha. It's interesting, uh, Andy, when we were talking one evening, um, sitting at the dinner table talking, he said, I asked him something, he said, you know, my sister's older than me, she remembers a lot more. So he just called her up and we had a conference call there sitting on the Finca, at, talking to his sister in Flagstaff, Arizona. Uh, here's the schoolhouse that, uh, that I lived in while, during my five days on the Finca there. It's a great place, it was a wonderful place, very, very beautiful, quiet. And like I said, you could walk over to San Jeronimo and this is the house that the Creeleys uh, lived in. It's actually quite a big house. The enclosed um, sort of screened in porch there in the in the the long wise photo was not enclosed when they lived in it. Uh, so they sort of sat and watched. Uh, they could watch, sat and watch the sunrise quite frankly come up over the volcanoes from the porch on that house. Uh, and here's another photo of San Jeronimo that the Burgess had actually. Uh, this is a shot looking up at Volcan Atitlan from the front yard of what was the schoolhouse. Uh, Joe Burge, the uh, hard-drinking Kentuckian, uh, who had grown up on the Finca himself, but had gone away to the United States to college, just like Andy. Andy was a wrestler at, uh, you know, he was a wrestler at the University of Illinois Champaign, actually. Uh, I'll tell you another very interesting thing about Mark Brissani and Andy Burge was that not only did they speak Spanish, perfectly Guatemalan, but they also spoke uh, Quiche Maya. I, I, I heard them conversing with uh, the workers on the Finca in Quiche Maya. Uh, I actually heard Mark Brissani doing it in Guatemala City with some people he had moved from the Finca or who he had hired into working at his office building in Guatemala City, but who had grown up on the Finca. Uh, here's that notorious pool around which so many hard drinking parties occurred. And other Finqueros, both Guatemalan and foreign born, uh, really looked forward to the Burgess parties. Uh, here's Miss Brissani, Joe Burge, uh, Mrs. Joe Burge, and Joe Burge's mother. So uh, the mother there, she had lived on this finca for some uh, 40 years at, at this point. And uh, Mrs. Joe Burge, uh, her name is Martha. Uh, she still lives in Guatemala now, but she's, um, she's not really, she's, she doesn't want to be interviewed. She doesn't want to talk about the past. Uh, and Miss Brissani is dead. She's passed away. Uh, Ms. Burge was well known for darting around the roads in the, that part of Guatemala in her little Mercedes um, convertible, two-seater. Um, this is the typical housing for the workers on the uh, Los Tarales. And this is a photo taken in the, probably the late 1950s. Um, uh, here again are the, all the children that uh, Robert Creeley taught, including his own two, and the, the, two bird, the three Burge kids and Mark Brassani. There's Andy Burge today, and there's Mark Brassani today in his office in Guatemala City. Um, I, I have to say both of these men, they were just sort of overflowing with information I could. Uh, they had had they had both lived through the guerrilla war, the Civil War, and wanted to tell me all their stories about uh, how, how surviving the Civil War, uh, how they sort of worked out the situation of being uh, a feudal master, if you will, in a situation where guerrillas are there to put down the feudal masters, uh, and then the people of the Finca basically being caught in the middle. Um, that's all I've got today, and I would love to hear any questions, any ideas about directions, uh, anything that's not particularly clear that you think should be uh, made more clearly. Uh, this is kind of 
what we do, I think, in brown bag talks is we run it up the flagpole and we sort of see how, uh, how it, who salutes and who turns their back. Yeah. People that he was corresponding with when he was down there, did anyone else come down? Nobody visited. Yeah. He's, in a couple of letters, he's sort of mildly trying to talk people into it, but he's not, he's not really giving it a, the old college try. Carol to do. It would, it would seem like a thing for Kerouac to do, but, but he didn't. Uh, he had been on some road trips that uh, are talked about in some other, he'd been on a couple of road trips with Ginsburg uh, previously throughout the Southwest from California to New Mexico around there, but uh, yeah. How does this period influence his creative work? Does he refer to Guatemala in metaphor or is that an image that shows up in his work? That's what Did I'm he talking. produce very much during that time? He produces a, a, a book of love poems dedicated to Bobby Louise Hawkins. Uh, and I've read them and I cannot, you know, there's a couple that are talking about rain. And I know they were clearly there during, you know, the rainy season, which is unforgettable in Guatemala. But uh, there's another poem where he's, it's to his daughters. I don't know if it's to four, all four of them, or just, and he's telling them to hang on to their name. Uh, but that's, you know, I'm not a Creeley expert, and I'm trying to read Creeley experts, but really, it's, I mean, the amount of literature focused on the Black Mountain College experience. It's, it's like, I mean, there's two things that come to mind that have as much written about them. One is baseball and the other one's a civil war. I mean, I mean, it's just, they're, it's just, uh, I mean, I'm wading through all this writing about Creeley, uh, you know, and uh, I may yet find, the thing is, is he also writes poems and then he doesn't publish them for 30 years sometimes. You know? So you, you can look at the poems he publishes in 1962, 63, yeah, but you know, he may not publish something until 1990, uh, which is the, the poem about Guatemala is not published until the 1990s. He mentions, and I, I found another poem where he does mention Guatemala. Um, the person that he seems to talk about Guatemala as much with as anybody else is William Carlos Williams. I'm not sure why that is. I mean, Olson is his mentor. Charles Olson is his mentor. And Olson wrote the Mayan letters at, at, because he was fascinated, as I, as I mentioned, with Mayan hieroglyphs in Yucatan. So uh, I, I'm not sure that Creeley was really around the Alberses, but I know that he was around Olson a lot and they must have talked. I mean, this is before Creeley goes to Guatemala, though. So, you know, Creeley never says, oh, I'm going there because Olson talked about the Maya all the time, right? But, but Guatemala must have been in his imaginings because of things that he and Olson had talked about, you know, at Black Mountain. And being in Asheville, I feel like we sort of just know a lot about Black Mountain College and what it was and kind of how unique it was. Do you think your audience at Socolas in Mexico will have that understanding? I mean, no. is your plan to do kind of more of an introduction? Yeah, but it has to be really short because I won't have this much time there, you know. Uh, yeah, it has to be condensed uh, and hopefully maybe in questions I can elaborate, but you know, those conference sessions are what they are, you know. That's a, yeah. Looking at the Creeley papers at Stanford, it's almost a hundred linear feet that was purchased in 10 different accessions. So in a large part of it is unprocessed. Do you think? So maybe? Maybe there's, I mean, if you got it 10 different accessions, Lord, that's bits and pieces from here to there probably. Do you think that there might be more there about Guatemala? And are you thinking about spending a little bit of time in California? Uh, there, there may be, uh, you know, I'm actually more interested in spending more time in Guatemala uh, than I am California. In fact, for years and years, friends of mine in California have been saying things like, why don't you come visit me? And I always say, when I have enough time and money to visit you in California, I'll go to Guatemala. 
But it just looks like there may be a lot there that has not been processed. Yeah. Uh, it's entirely possible. All we need uh, to do I, is have a student from here graduate, go to graduate school there, and then process the Greeley papers and get idea. back with you. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good idea. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know what's going on with Bobby Louise Hawkins's uh, papers and things, you know. I mean, she, she just passed away in May. So did he essentially go down there to teach three, three kids plus his own? Yeah. He had seen an ad uh, in 57 where the, the Bersanis and the Burgess had gotten together and they had, they had, he was actually the second teacher that they had lured or hired down there. Uh, and there's two more after him, in fact. Uh, and uh, the, he, he wrote them in 57 and said, you know, uh, that's not enough money. I would come for $3,000. And they were offering $1,500. He said, I'll come for 3000 and uh, uh, eventually I've not seen any of these letters. You know, the Brassanis and the Burgess didn't know anything about these letters. And they have a lot of stuff there, too. Uh, they were telling me they believed that they had some film, in fact. But Mom has it. Uh, uh, so, and I've, been lo I've looked for that ad. I can't find that ad, I, you know. Where do you put an ad like that in a paper in the United States? You know, maybe I haven't been able to find that ad. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to find that. Um, but so he, he thought about it for a while. And you know, as, as you might imagine, he's a, he's a starving artist. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, he's really struggling to make ends meet at this time in his life. There's, and he has four children. And uh, he's looking for a, I think the experience in Mallorca where things were also economical and he was able to not work too much and write a lot led him to think about doing the same thing in Guatemala, maybe even more of it. I, I, I know that the, often the cost of living in Central America is a lure to writers from here. related question also to Leah's question about the Latin American studies context for this talk. I wonder if uh, instead of the, the, the mystique of Black Mountain College, they will hear, oh, here's another white radical exploiting his race, class, and gender privilege to like aggrandize himself. Is that like a harsh way of talking about? No, I, I think it, it, to, to, I mean, I, I'm working on a expatriates who go there in the 1890s right now. Uh, um, so it's certainly uh, the, the case of what's going on there and, and, sti and still going on there, quite frankly. Um, people who go there because, uh, and you know, to life is cheap, right? In so many ways. Well, I was thinking I was thinking about that in terms of um, the time period in which they were there too and just, I mean, he was going there to teach for this privileged class of people um, and I just wonder, if, do you think that there's much out there about how, how that played into his experience in... That they were privileged? Yeah. No, he doesn't like them. Creeley doesn't like them. He yeah. considers himself a leftist radical, and he doesn't really like them. But he also, he's also, I mean, frankly, Creeley likes to drink, and Burge has free booze, and he parties with them very hard. And Bobby Louise Hawkins is not; she's not nearly as fond of it as as Creeley is, uh, and for a lot of reasons. I mean, the the women are all treated pretty harshly. And as a leftist radical, I mean, was he going out and trying to... No. He was in his head a leftist radical. Okay. <laughs> but a misogynist and radical. Absolutely. That's undeniable. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, Foss, the uh, author of his biography, the, the, Andy Burge and Mark Bersani both seem to remember Foss coming through and asking questions. Uh, but I, I, 
I'm not sure that he did. They they would have been young, you know, much younger and a little more uh, scattered. Not scattered up here, but scattered around the countryside at the time. Someone could. they seem to remember somebody else coming through and asking questions before me. <laughs> that it? It's That's about time for, is, huh? It, it is very fascinating. The whole Black Mountain thing is, is um, Black Mountain's connection with Latin America is it's just such a weaving, you know? So it's, um, and I have to thank uh, Brian Butler for helping finance the trip that I took. Uh, it's about a 20 days, between 15 and 20 days to Guatemala, it was quite a, it's, it's not easy to get to where these fincas are now. It's chicken bus, basically. Uh, and then you just get off the bus on the side of the road and you walk up to the finca. Of course, by the time, after I introduced myself, they were driving me around in their cars and, you know, Mark Brassani gave me one of his iPhones while I was there so I didn't have to worry about uh, using my own there, so. They, they, Brissani is very, very, very well off. Burge is struggling. Interesting place. Interesting lives. Very interesting lives. Okay, we got class. <laughs>